Hello, and thanks for joining Your Body Advocate Podcast. I am Ruth Cummings, your host, and today I'm interviewing my friend, Dr. Jisun Sunny Fisher. She's a psychologist and the best selling author and a happiness coach. Her new book is called The Bodhi Blueprint. And today we have a really fun conversation about how fear is held in the body and the different parts of the brain. It's a really fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Let's take a deep breath to relax. Ready? All right. Here we go. You're listening to Your Body Advocate, telling your body's side of the story. The podcast dedicated to supporting and improving your body-mind connection so you can live a pain-free, passion-filled life, dissolving one body tension at a time. Discover the healing properties of your own body language, and together, let's explore ways to support and improve essential self-talk. Now, here's your host, Master of Encouragement and Body-Mind Life Coach, Ruth Cummings. Thank you for joining us. I am Ruth Cummings with Your Body Advocate. And today I have a good friend of mine. I'm so excited you're here. We've been trying to get this together for a long time. All right. Today we have G-Sun, Sunny Fisher. She's a licensed psychologist, a best-selling author and happiness coach with a superpower of helping others find their compelling direction and discover how to fall in love with life again. With graduate degrees from Columbia University and the University of Connecticut, Dr. J has been featured and bustle, goal cast, and more. She loved hiking with her pups, exploring anything woo woo, and making annual trips to her beloved land of Hawaii. If you catch her cooking in the kitchen, run the other way. <laughs> <laughs> you can find more at bodyful.com. That's B O D H I F U L L Y, in case you don't see our notes on the bottom. And there's a lot of links for her also in the notes. You can always text me or email me if you need those. Jisun. <laughs> I am so excited to finally be sitting here and recording this with you. I know. We Thank could talk so all day. Oh, for it's great to have you. Now. So um, I really want to talk about, eventually, I want to talk about your book that you've written mm-hmm. called The Bodhi Blueprint. It's a beautiful book. I have several in front of me right now. But I wanted to, you and I were just discussing a question, and I'd love to get your input on this. Mm. Where do you feel fear is held in the body? And Mm. how does fear, especially those types held in the body, how does it hold us back as leaders? How would you answer that? I love that that question. Love that question. (laughs) I lit up. I don't know if you saw my face, but I lit up when you brought that question up. Especially because it, there's something about it that tickles me in the sense that I don't have an answer prepared, as you know, because we haven't talked about these questions. Yes. But I was thinking about your question as you were introducing me, and I realized depending on which fear we're talking about, I think it gets stored in different parts of the body. And I think based on your personal experiences, the way that it gets stored in the body is completely different from the person sitting next to you on your right. For me, the way that fear the way that I, my body holds fear is definitely in my throat. It completely stops me from expressing my authentic truth, from expressing who I am, from not just being vulnerable, but being transparent about, you know, who I am and how I think and, you know, how I'm perceiving everything in my environment. And for me, it it affects leadership in the sense that fear, you know, when we have fear and we are observing it in other animals or primates, And I hate this part of me, but when I was in graduate school, we used to experiment on mice. And the thing that mice do, and almost all animals do when we are confronted with fear, is three things. We fight, flight, or freeze. And all three of those things actually prevent us from being able to tap into the real part of us. The part of us that is unencumbered with other people's stories, unencumbered with other people's expectations or other people's perspectives on how this world spins. Yes. So yes. for me, fear shows up specifically for me, if you it shows up in my throat in the way that I express what I'm truly feeling and it prevents me from just tapping into my, my realness. I love that for sure. <laughs> I know I jumped this question on you and I, yeah. So different types of fear 
that's another thing. So fight, flight, or freeze. And the the throat response in me is also. So when I look at my own fear also, for example, um, like imposter syndrome or feeling like I don't have, uh, that what I have to say isn't important or mm. these types of things. I think I feel that in the back of my upper back. I'm feeling, mm. I feel that like this kind of um, weight on me, like I have to, I have to get it off before I can, before I can continue. Mm -hmm. And I think the interesting thing is that, no, you don't have to get that off before you can continue. You can just mm. do it now. Yeah. And um, so there's another one. So there's physical, I mean, I'm just so fascinated because you say fight, flight, or freeze, which many people have heard that before mm -hmm. in the body. I find that there's a specific muscle that has to do with fight or flight breathing that mm -hmm. tenses up on someone who is having a hard time going to their next level of leadership. So I just think that's really interesting because they can't breathe in. And then if we can't breathe in, we're not going to be able to express ourselves, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that we can't express ourselves if our, our fear is held in our throat? Wow. Specific to the throat, I'm not sure. Um, it's just the way that I feel fear most of the time. And I think that has a lot to do with why I'm here and my life purpose. And for someone who's listening, that might or might not be true for them. Um, but when you were talking about how there is a specific muscle in the front here, um, I don't know if it's just specific to the right side or the left side of our chest, but you were pointing to that specific Both muscle. Sides. Both sides. Okay. That specific muscle that helps us to breathe or breathe in. And I think when we're talking about the throat or the throat chakra, there is definitely that piece where if I'm not taking a sufficient breath in, I can't produce what I need to produce out. And when I'm feeling fear, especially if I'm engaging in fight, flight, or freeze, I have no resources in terms of being able to channel what I would like to, to connect deeper to what I need to express. So if I'm feeling afraid that if I were to go up on stage and I express my true opinion that people would mock me or laugh at me, the resources, the breath that I'm taking in isn't being used for me to connect deeper to my truth and express what's true, but that breath is being utilized to pump all of my blood, the oxygen-rich blood into my extremities because I need to be ready to either fight, flight, or freeze. And you had said that when you feel fear, you feel like there's this weight on your shoulder. And I'm wondering if that's reflective of how maybe in a lot of your fearful experiences, your go-to reaction is freeze. Is that true? Yes. <clears throat> like right now, um, yeah, I freeze when I feel like I have too much, too many obligations. And so I, I will lay in bed. Or I will mm -hmm. sit in a car, mm -hmm. or instead of um, my normal actions, just like you know, ADHD brain just. Purr. And so, um, one of the the ways that I think I find comfort is to sit still mm -hmm. and not do anything, and also with my thoughts, instead of figuring something out, just staying still. Mm -hmm. And so. I think that not only is it a fear response, but is it a, like, it's all these things, right? They're keeping us um, in survival mode, Yeah, you know? And so we can't, we can't dig, like you're saying, we can't dig into our real selves because we're staying in the steady survival mode. Mm -hmm. And like, I love how you explain it because this is what I'm trying to show people that they can get their body out of the way you can get these things to calm down, right? So that we can access those deeper awesomenesses of each of us, our superpowers. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's, <a, laughs> That's a total. <laughs> I have a lot of good Ruthisms. <laughs> oh, I love that. But where, where else? Okay, so throat. Where have mm -hmm. you seen fear reside in people or yourself? Yeah. So I can tell you how I see fear showing up. I'm not sure how that specific person that I'm observing might actually experience it in their bodies. So when we tend to engage in the fear reaction of fight, you'll see a lot of anger come up. So people that get super angry usually have that fear response of fight. 
people who like to engage in the reaction of flight typically likes to avoid things. So it's slightly different from freezing in that they know what they need to do in order for them to reach their goals, but they do anything and everything to avoid it. So there are lots of justifications and reasoning as to why they can or cannot do that. And then for those of us that experience freeze, we feel that that sense of like, I, I need silence, I need to be still. We also experience it a lot in this, this sense of, oh my God, I feel so stuck. So we engage in a, a freeze response to fear when we experience on, the, on a majority part or when we experience for the most part in our lives in a way where we feel like life is stagnant. So if life becomes stagnant, we know that we engage in that flight response typically to fear. And like you said, when we're experiencing fear, we can't tap down into the real awesomeness that we are because we are human beings, right? So we can say that we have a spiritual journey, but in this physical human body, we have a hardware in our brains. We actually have three. We have three brains in the skull, not just one. And as long as we don't placate all three of those brains in our skulls, we have a lot of these resources that are consumed to keep us safe in that survival mode. Yeah. I love how you're saying that. The Tell me more about the three brains in our... Yeah. Yeah. So it's called the triune brain. And when we think about the human body, we evolved from primates. And so thousands of years ago, we were cavemen and women. And in order for us to stay alive, we needed to look for things that were wrong in our environment. This is why we are wired to be super pessimistic and to look for the negative things in our environment. So as long as you're, it's called the reptilian brain, and it's essentially the brain stem, it's all the way at the core of our brains. If the reptilian brain is activated because we don't believe we're safe, then every other part, hierarchically speaking, of our brain shuts off. It's that safety valve. So if we're not safe, if we're about to get hit by a car, we're not thinking about what we want to have for dinner, how we're going to dress for that really important meeting tomorrow. None of those things matter because our safety and our survival is first and foremost. The next part of our brain that evolved is the mammalian brain, and this part of the brain encases and covers the reptilian brain. The mammalian brain is very important for things like social connections and feeling and processing emotions. It's also really important for us in in terms of how we consolidate memory as well. So when your mammalian brain is activated, it means you're questioning, am I loved? Am I, um, do I feel like I have a sense of belonging? And it processes all of these emotions that we think of typically as part of the human experience. So Ruth, if you and I were having a really bad fight and I was getting really heated up, there is nothing that you could say logically or reasonably that would get me out of that state. Because when my mammalian brain is activated, the other part, the higher part of the human brain completely shuts off. This is why when you're in a heated fight, it doesn't matter what you try and tell them or speak them out of whatever they're feeling because their feeling state is activated. The final part of the human brain that evolved is all the way at the top. It's called the neocortex, referred to as the human part of the brain. This is part of the brain, the part of the brain where we um, activate to reason, to plan out something like a wedding or a dinner or a party. This is the part of our brains that we use to create logic and to understand what happened in the past versus maybe worrying about the future. So the way that the brain is wired, again, it's the the most primitive part of the brain, the reptilian part of the brain. When it's activated, everything else shuts off. When the next part of the brain, if you feel like you are um, um, a victim of injustice, you know, the top part of your brain, the neocortex then shuts off. So The triune brain is really important for us in terms of processing our fears. And the really neat thing that I learned about us as human beings and the fears that we experience is that it's very connected to what keeps the world spinning. So when you think about the three only things that keep the world spinning, what would you guess that they would be? The three only things. Love, mm-hmm. fear, okay, and hunger. Okay, 
close. So the three only things that matter that keep this world spinning, like you said, is death, right? It's the part of us that are afraid, the part of us that have these primitive fears of survival. So death, love, and power. Anything and everything that any single one of us as human beings are pursuing is one of those three things. So each part of the, the human brain, the three parts, remember, in the skull, has a direct need. And that direct need is very closely associated with what keeps our world spinning. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, so how would you, so I would love to just pick your brain on this a little bit. (laughs) Pardon the pun. Um, the pick your brain, like where fear resides and the different types of fear. Mm -hmm. So there's like the fear of death and then power. Where is power? Can Mm. power, where does power get stuck in the body? Ooh, and where does it, where does it like get uh, charged from? Ooh, that's a really good question. Let's talk this through. Yeah. So when we are afraid of dying, yeah. the death component, it's the reptilian part of our brains that have a fear. And the question typically that we ask ourselves is, am I safe? When we are talking about the mammalian okay. part of the brain and we're worried about, you know, do I belong? Am I accepted? Am I going to get rejected? Typically, the questions resolve around or revolve around, am I loved, right? And then the final part of the brain, the neocortex or the human part of the brain has a particular fear. And that fear, I call it power, but it's essentially, am I happy? Am I satisfied? Am I fulfilled? So if I have a fear that I will not leave a legacy behind that suits me or that would make me proud Or if I have a fear that I'm going to be on my deathbed at 105 years old and going, wow, I really need a do-over. The part of my body that I can only imagine, I must imagine um, affecting or the the part of my body that is affected by fear has got to be someplace in my shoulders. I don't know why. That's where my my thought first went to my shoulders and my collarbone. Interesting. Okay. Okay. What are your thoughts on that, given what you know about the body? Yeah, I love that. I love this conversation. This is right up my alley because so the shoulder, like you were saying before with me, holding the world on your shoulders, too many things on your plate, too many obligations, Mm -hmm. taking Mm -hmm. care of too many people. As it goes in closer to the neck, we hold like um, 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 not feeling appreciated Mm -hmm. and then being resentful about the closest one to the neck on the back is not feel so not feeling appreciated about right here and then a little bit closer to the spine is really being resentful about that Mm -hmm. and then the front of the throat also has to do with communicating that so when you're talking about right below the clavicle the clavicle or or the the collarbone guys sorry um the collarbone right that goes across makes the t of your body if you don't know um those those where those bones are so the t um, part of the of the bone structure, right below that holds the some of the meridians that are uh, based on grief. So mm-hmm. some of the ones that are with lungs is my one of the main ones. So okay. it's large intestine four that or large intestine meridian, and it starts kind of on the right side right here, the right side between your forefinger and your thumb. Okay, so what you were saying is like power. In order to speak power. Like the power chakra is the one that goes, it's yellow and it's right below where the ribs come together, Mm -hmm. right in the middle. And Mm -hmm. so it has to come out and all this has to be open for that to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so for all of the leaders that we work with, there is, there, there, there's a great, there's great ways for each individual. And it is so unique for them to be able to have that power come out of their body. Mm -hmm. And it's unique on why it's stuck and where it's stuck. So there's no just, you know, uh, black and white, you do this breath work. That's not going to work for each person, but it will work for many. And, and to find your own little flow chart, I like to call it, what's the flow chart to get it out of your body. Um, that's, I think that's the key to finding the path of your most inner power, most inner superpowers that can come out. So mm-hmm. I love it how you're saying right here. 
because I work on that all the time. Yeah. And I'm, you know, a lot of that's around the lymph too. So that's interesting because it's getting rid of like deeper, um, it's just such deep um, emotions dealing with um, cancer with my husband right now mm-hmm. and how the body gets rid of um, poison. Mm-hmm. And the lymph system, it's um, it's also fascinating in that area. And then how it deals with grief, like, you know, am I dying and the fear of death? So everything you've mentioned today, like, is happening in my world over here. And I'm just fascinated <laughs> by <laughs> how my brain handles it compared mm-hmm. with, like, how my husband's brain is handling it. Mm-hmm. And then how my body handles um, what's happening mm-hmm. and how... Um, you know, how to put all those together and to be the best power and um, the best um, compassionate uh, healer for ourselves that I can yeah. um, uh, try to find and where to find that. Yeah. Can I ask you a I personal love, question? Uh, can I, I love put in the what you brought really up. Quick? Of course, please. Of course. <laughs> so <laughs> when we hopped on our call, um, the first thing that I recognized was there was a, I want to call it pain, but it wasn't sharp pain but pain in my right side on my back so like mid back where the bottom part of my rib cage would be and I don't know what that part of the body means for you because it literally just came on as soon as we hopped on the call what can you share with us about maybe that part of the body sure both right and left, right underneath the rib cage is a fear area. So that's main fear area. It's right with, and it, it usually where I would find, and also watching your posture, it would probably go across from your left shoulder to that right hip. Mm-hmm. And so um, it could be a couple things because the left shoulder is barely coming in a little bit that does show that the fight or flight muscles are tight and they're mm-hmm. going to pull on the front. So here's the front mm-hmm. of the shoulder and the, and the hip comes like this. They'll go together like a clam yeah. and that um, will create some tenderness on the back, on the, mm-hmm. uh, on the right side. Sometimes mm-hmm. it though, it can go straight up to the right neck or the right side. So it kind of depends on mm-hmm what's happening and you're right. Show me, I just want to make sure we're not, we're not flipped, which is your right side. Okay. Yeah. Is it but higher I, like that? Is it higher? It's, or um, I guess when I said mid back, it's kind of like on the upper side of the mid part of the back. Okay. And so on the, the reason cage. why, yes. And the okay. reason why I brought it up wasn't necessarily because I uh, identified it as mine, but it ah, feels yeah. like it's yours. Okay. For that, for sure. I mean, um, I feel so. That's a that's a powerlessness. That area mm. is it's just um, just below powerlessness, but it also is just below betrayal. And there's some things I'm feeling betrayed um, by some people and and uh, just things in my society because of um, my husband getting having cancer and not getting mm-hmm. diagnosed quickly enough. Mm-hmm. Like I'm feeling really just angry about that. Mm-hmm. And so you probably, you might be feeling that Wow, because um, wow, I'm definitely fantastic. holding that right now. <laughs> if for you, is that, is that a fear of, am I safe? Am I loved or am I happy? Safe. Gotcha. Can we go six months going to doctor after doctor to doctor and not mm-hmm. get any support? Mm-hmm. Um, if, if that, if they're not going to help us, what else can we do? And so it's gotcha. definitely a safety fear of death yeah. and mainly fear of his death. Right. Mm-hmm. So then for me, I think it's abandonment, uh, being alone, mm-hmm. um, you know, losing my partner, like, like there's a lot to that, but for me, it's like, um, oh, and for sure I've been having, like, I have these cough drops uh-huh. <laughs> because I'm having a hard time communicating. I'm having a hard time swallowing this. It is not wow. something I want to swallow. I don't want to assimilate it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to look at it clearly. So I'm getting eye headaches. Um, so okay. f- for sure, I'm going through a lot of the things that I teach, <laughs> and I think that happens often, right? Where okay, um, 
let's 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 really feel what people out there are feeling mm -hmm. because I can communicate it and explain it so much better if I'm going through it myself. Unfortunately, absolutely. It's like this, but I think that's our whole lives are a classroom, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you have your own pain right there or was it just No, it was as soon up? as we hopped on the call. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Wow, well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I love those, you know, those questions on the spot. Um, I did that to you too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're almost out of time. I can't believe it. But I want it to tell us about your book real quick in our time that we have left. Um, yeah, absolutely. And where can they find it? And where can they find you? And another question I have for you, can we do this again? Can you jump on here with me? <laughs> I again? would love that. I would love that, Ruth. So the book came together. Um, I knew at some point in my life, maybe 10 years ago, that I wanted to write a book. And at that point in time, I thought I was going to write a children's book. Um, but that idea kind of just came and went and I didn't really think about it. But I'm the type of person, if I don't write down what I'm thinking about, that's like a hot moment for me, I'll forget it. So over the last few years, probably since 2017-ish, I started just writing down everything that was coming, whether you want to call them downloads or transmissions, just things started pouring in and I would write them down. And I remember sitting at my computer at one point going, oh my gosh, there is enough here to like write a book. And the way that it came together, it arranged itself. I had no idea it was going to be about fears. I had no idea. I had no zero clue about what or how this book was going to organize itself. And it just did. And I had an amazing, wonderful editor who actually helped me to tie some of these ideas together in a way that is digestible. Um, and the book just came together. It really is. It comes from the premise that life should, I don't like that word. So I'm going to start over. It really comes from this premise that we don't take enough responsibility for are moment to moment thoughts. And what I mean by that is if someone were to ask me what my favorite movie is, I tell them one of my favorite, I have two, one of my favorite movies is Saw. And if you haven't watched the movie Saw, I'm not going to ruin it for you, but it's a very gory psychological thriller. And I just remember at the end of that movie, I had like intense body it, like chills and just really like core physiological reaction to what I was hearing. And at the end of that movie, there's something that catches me by surprise. And the phrase, and I'm going to totally butcher it, but it goes something like, you know, Dr. Gordon, so many people in this world take their lives for granted, but not you, not anymore. And I just remember at that point in time, like all of my conscious awareness went straight into my gut. And I, I was asking myself, am I taking my life for granted? If I knew that I was going to die tomorrow, would I be doing the same things, entertaining the same thoughts, creating value in the things that I thought were valuable? And the answers I kept coming back was, no, I'm not living a life that was intentional or purposeful. And so for me, from that point on, I've had this obsession with life purpose, how life purpose isn't something that comes and finds you. It's not a noun. Your life purpose is not, it's actually not even a verb. Right. It's it's the, what is that? A, not an adjective. What describes an, a verb? An adverb. It's how we choose to show up every day. And knowing that we each have our own responsibility, our birthright to choose how we show up. So the things that we think we're supposed to be pursuing in our lives, whether it's money or love, everything that leads to happiness, whether we think we need to pursue inspiration, the things that we feel that we think are, you know, joy, happiness, inspiration, love, those things only happen as a byproduct to let us know that we're on the right track. So as leaders, how do we know we're on the right track? It's making sure we know how to ask ourselves the right questions. And if you are to ask yourself the right questions based on the fact that we have three brains in our skulls, it sounds something like, in this moment, am I, am I feeling in flow? Am I relaxed? Or am I trying to be willful about how life is supposed to look? In this moment, am I feeling connected, not just to other people, but to myself as well, to source and God, something greater than me? In this moment, do I feel inspired? Do I feel grateful and appreciative in the moment? Do I feel like I'm alive and I get to do whatever really fulfills me? 
So as long as every moment we're asking ourselves those questions, we understand as leaders, maybe we're on the right track. And the thing about all of this, Ruth, is that, you know, all my, my spiritual journey started with a, I think it was like a Tony Robbins event where I thought it was all about the success achievements, but the success and achievements, those things that we think of as smart goals really don't mean anything. In, in fact, if we leave, if we live a life that is aligned, those things that we call goals are just mile markers to let us know how far we've come, how much we've grown. So I've learned to create goals that aren't smart, S-M-A-R-T, but I learned to look at my goals within four areas, my mind, my body, my heart, and my spirit. And the goals that I have in terms of my vision is my goal compelling because I could sit here and create a vision board about how it would be amazing to live in Hawaii on the beach with my dogs. But I realized because I actually did this, I created a vision board where I was on the beach in Maui (laughs) with my dogs. It wasn't compelling. Yes, it sounds good. Sure, I would love to be on the beach, but it wasn't compelling. So I would look at my vision board. I would see my goals and it just didn't inspire me to move. So when I think about my vision now and I think about my goals, I have to ask myself, are my goals compelling? Are they achievable, right? I can't say that, you know, tomorrow I'm going to X, Y, and Z. Are they achievable? Let's be a little bit more realistic in terms of the timeline. Is it aligned with who I am? Is it aligned with who I am? Not what I think others expect of me. And are my goals clear? Do I understand what it is that I want because they're compelling? Those are awesome. (laughs) I know we we froze there just for a second. So, so this is, this is all in the book, right? Yes and no. So yes, it is but probably in different language. Um, but it's a really great question that you're asking because I did want to share with your listeners, Ruth, if you would like, I would give you a link um, yes. where they can actually access a free journal called the Bodhi Journal that helps us to digest what it is that we're thinking of when we want a compelling life that we want to live on purpose and how to actually diagram it out and write it out in such a way that we are making sure that we're staying on track in a way that feels right and not in a way that we think life is supposed to look like. Love that. Yes. Thank you for that free gift. That is awesome. I will get that from you and I'll add it to the notes there. Um, no, I, I love journaling. I think that um, journaling should be done in every school across the world. Um, and I, I've seen this journal of yours and it's amazing. So people get this journal. It's very helpful. You guys, it really is amazing anytime. And are you accepting uh, clients right now? Are you accepting new uh, coaching clients or any type of client? Or are you, yep. So uh, I will be available. Would you to rather? Start how how would you like clients? them to work with you? Yeah. So I will be okay. available to work privately <laughs> one-to-one with clients, probably in January or February. Right now, if you would like to um, actually connect with me, you can find me on Instagram. It's uh, bodifully. So Instagram.com slash b o d h i f u l l y. And the way that I'm actually connecting with a lot of people is through my website. It's bodifully.com slash tribe. One of the things that I found missing in my one-to-one work with clients is that we can be done with our work, but at the end, they continue to see me or they continue to book sessions with me because they think they still need to work one-on-one when in fact, 95% of the time they're ready. It's just, they don't have that sense of connection, that sense of tribe. So I've created a space where you are part of that tribe as well, Ruth, where people can come join us and to really yes. ask ourselves the the right meaningful questions. That's great. I do like that tribe. It's amazing. I've been there more and I, I will be. I noticed that you're rubbing that back and I hope that doesn't stay with you long. <laughs> you just, <laughs> you're just doing that. You're like, oh, uh, let it go. Let it go. Um Okay, I love all these links. And how do they get your book? How do they where do they find that? Is that yeah, on Amazon, absolutely. right? Yep. They can go on Amazon. I and have the link Bodhi below, Blueprint. but okay. The Bodhi Blueprint. Awesome. So G Sun 
Sunny Fisher, Dr. J, thank you so much for being here today. Thank I can't wait to so do this again. Fun. We will do this early uh, in of 2023. And um, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Your Body Advocate with Ruth Cummings. We're so glad you've joined us today and truly believe you can live a pain-free, passion-filled life. To connect with Ruth, work with Ruth, or to grab your free ebook, go to ruthcummings.com. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. Until next time, friends, be open, include the unincluded, think outside the box, and spread love and kindness one smile at a time.